Well, good morning, Kingdom Life community and friends. We are so glad to have you with us here today. Thank you very much for joining us as we are still streaming virtually from the studio. And we are excited that we have this opportunity to stream into your home, onto your devices, wherever you are. We hope that you can uh, settle in for this word. We invite you to have your Bible handy, have your device ready, have something that you can use to grab some notes, maybe take some pictures, and we are going to get ready to go into the Word of the Lord. We bring you greetings from our home to yours and pray that during this time that we are meeting virtually, that every one of us is taking the precautions to remain safe and that the Lord is keeping us in divine health. So that said, let's get ready for the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to come before you to consider your word. We pray, O God, that you would speak through your servant so that those who hear this message will hear not just words from a man, but that they will hear the living word of God. Thank you, Father, for your promise. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the anointing in your word. We pray that it would go forth and land on good ground and bring forth fruit, not 30, not 60, but 100 fold. All this we pray in the wonderful name of Yeshua, who is the Christ. Amen. Well, let's get into the word of the Lord. I welcome you this morning to Discipleship 101, Season 4, Episode 3. We are moving right along, and I'm going to ask you to join me in Matthew chapter 28 as we establish our very familiar anchor scripture at this point. Matthew 28, verse 18, and Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's take a look at our $64,000 question. If God has so clearly called each of us to go, why aren't we just going? That passage is so clear that if God has so clearly given a mandate and a call for us as the church to go, then the question is, why aren't we just going? Well, here's what we know. We know that people naturally share what they really care about with those they really care for. No one has to tell them to do it. It just happens. We also know that what is missing for most who claim to be Christians is experience with God's awesome glory. The glory of God is the missing ingredient and the key to unlocking our faith. And from there, we're able to deduce that anyone claiming to be a Christian who is not regularly encountering God and experiencing his glory is either not really a Christian, or is, but living like they are not. And that brings us to today's message. Welcome to Discipleship 101, Season 4, Episode 3, There's Only Hope. There's only hope. Would you just, somebody, wherever you are, just say, there's only hope. If you If your connection dropped off and you weren't able to hear the rest of this, you need to walk away knowing there's only hope. Now, the passage that I just read for you in Matthew chapter 28 is what is known as the Great Commission. But theologians also recognize another Great Commission, which is found in the book of Acts. And book of Acts, the book of Acts Great Commission appears in Acts chapter 1. It's familiar to us. It's verse 8. And that is known as the Great Commission of Acts. And it reads, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, 
in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is the great commission of Acts where the Lord tells his disciples just prior to the day of Pentecost what's going to happen after the Holy Spirit has come upon them and empowers them to do what he has been teaching them in the Gospels to do. We must remember, as we read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that the men that are pictured there as disciples of Christ, they were followers of Christ. They were part of his gang. They were part of his grouping, but they were unsaved men. They were unsaved men because they did not carry the Spirit of Christ. And so because they did not carry the Spirit of Christ, they were just natural men following Christ Yeshua. Now, after his ascension and after the outpouring on the day of Pentecost, they are going to receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. And as they do now, they're going to be saved and empowered to live the kingdom, the Christian life. So I, I, I've said this many times, and I want to just give this quote again. A person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with a theory. A person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with a theory. If you've never had water and you've got your ideas about what it tastes like, and I've been drinking water all my life, you really can't tell me anything because you have a theory about water when I actually have the experience of having ingested it. And so a person with an experience never has to subject themselves to the opinions of a person who has a theory. So then the question comes up, well, which one am I? Am I one with a solid theory about Christ that has been implanted since childhood? Am I a theoretical believer? Am I one who's got a well-entrenched, solid theory about Christ that's been implanted in my mind through my upbringing and my indoctrination and my training as a child? I was always taught as a child. I was told as a child. Growing up, I was always taught. Is that where my relationship with Christ is coming from? What I was taught as a child, as an unsaved person? Or am I one, the question is, am I one with firsthand life-changing salvific experience with Yeshua Christ? Have, do I speak of him as one who's been born again, as one who's been filled with his spirit? Am I theoretical or am I experiential? And that's the question that begs to be answered today by every person under the sound of my voice, which one am I? And here's what I want to say. Before you go too far with your answer, regardless of your answer, there's no shame in not having an experience. There is no shame in being a theoretical Christian. There's no shame in that. There's only hope. Somebody say there's only hope. Listen, there's no reason to make this about you. There's no reason to internalize this, regardless of where you came out. There's no reason to internalize this and make this about you and what you don't have and what you don't. There's no reason to feel like a fake Christian. You might be, but we can fix that. We can do something about that. But sitting around feeling like a fake Christian, that's just going to become self-defeating. So there's no life in that, and there's no reason to feel beat up. Like, God, uh, here I am again. Here comes pastor again. Uh, no, there's no reason for that. I need you to know that there's only hope. I want to show you God's freedom-producing truth. Experiencing God is simple. It really is. Experiencing God is it's just a two-step process. It, it only takes two realities. If you have these two realities in your life, experiencing God is, is an automatic. It's going to happen in your life. Number one, you must be saved. And number two, 
you must be surrendered. If you want to have experience with God, where God is active in your life, and instead of you having a theoretical relationship with God where you think God is and you hope God is, that kind of thing, all you have to do is meet these two criteria. You must be saved, and secondly, you must be surrendered. Now, here's the thing I want to say. It's just two steps. You're just two steps away from glory. Just two steps away from glory. If you're not sure you're saved, you can do something about that. You can pray for the Holy Spirit. Look with me at Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke eleven thirteen. 13. The scripture says, If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the, your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If you're not sure you're saved, all you have to do is ask the Father for his Holy Spirit, and he has promised that if you ask the Holy Spirit, he will give him to you. You can be saved. You may be saying, well, I, I'm, I'm not surrendered. If you're not surrendered to God, that's simple. You can do something about that. All you have to do is to press into God's will with all your being. If you will press into God's will with all your being, you will come to a surrendered place because it is difficult for you to fight the power of God's word at work in your life once you expose yourself to the running water of God's word running over your soul. It's going to wash away this world and it's going to fill you with the Spirit of God. Mark chapter 4, beginning, look at verse 3 and then verse 8. This is how you press in. He said, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. That ought to be, your, your, that ought to be a statement about you every day of your life, that you go out to sow. That every day you are, you are the sower. The pastor is not the sower. You are the sower in your own life, and you sow. What does the sower do? The sower sows. Are you sowing? Are you sowing like you're trying to really produce a harvest? If you sow like you're trying to produce a harvest, it will produce surrender in your life. But then it goes on and says, But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And so we look at that and we recognize that if you have good ground, if you are sowing the word into good ground, it is going to produce a harvest. You've got to do the work. You, you say, I'm not surrendered. Do the work. Well, I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I've been living like this. I've been this way. Do the work. You can be transformed. You can be transformed by the renewing of your mind, but you've got to do the work. So it's not of works, it's of grace, but you have to do work, corresponding actions, faith without work is dead. If you believe that God is in the transforming business and that he is conforming you to the image of his son, do the work. And as you do the work, check your soil to make sure that your soil really is good ground. So it, it, it raises the question, do I have a healthy response to God's word? We talked about this before. A healthy response to God's word, I would acknowledge the word of God as truth. I would accept it as truth for me. And then I would apply it to every area of my life. And here, here's the thing. The fact is that to make it truly good ground, the missing element for most Christians is applying the word to their lives. Oh, yeah, that's for me. Put it in the chat. That's for me. I hear you. I receive it. Don't receive it. Use it. Apply it. Live by it. it. The word doesn't become transformative until you apply it to your life. You're waiting for the Holy Spirit to apply it. He has given you the power to apply it. Apply the word. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. How am I processing God's word in my life? 
Matthew chapter 4 tells us the Lord speaks and he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So, so the, the word of God is the bread of life. So we understand then that God's word is the bread of life, and he does not want us simply chewing it. He wants us to swallow, digest, and process it throughout our being. Failure to completely process God's word is an indication that we are suffering from a blockage in our spiritual digestive tract. So let's have a little honest self-assessment. Is the word getting through to me? Am I applying the truth in my life? Is my heart really good ground? Am I in my own way? Regardless of what you say to those questions, I want you to know there's only hope. There's only hope. When I say there's only hope, I say regardless of your response to those questions, there is no room for guilt, shame, or self-loathing in the kingdom. There's only hope. Somebody where you are, say there's only hope. I need you to hear there's only hope. This is not a performance thing. It's not something you work at hard enough and get. It's a God thing, and with God, there's always hope. Somebody say There's always hope. I need to know, do you believe that? There is always hope. I want you to walk with me through the scripture so that I I need to build a case for the fact that there is always hope. When it comes to God, there's always hope. You don't have to hear this message, this series, and think, well, I'm not experiencing God. I just don't even know if I'm a Christian. I don't even know if I'm saved. I think I'm saved. I don't know if I'm saved. I think I'm saved. They told me I was saved. I think I'm saved. You don't have to live like that. Why would you be in that kind of doubt and hopelessness and despair when you can walk in confidence and assurance, full of hope, that God's plan is being fulfilled in your life? What are we talking about when we talk about hope? I want to tell you what hope is. Hope is the earnest expectation that the will and promise of God shall come to pass in my life. That's hope. Hope has nothing to do with I'm hoping things work out. I'm hoping I get the job. I'm hoping my sister calls before nine. That's not hope. Biblical hope is the earnest expectation that the will and promise of God are going to be fulfilled in the earth. That's hope. And so as we talk about hope, let's go in and take a look. Let's walk through the scripture and see what God says to us about hope. Romans chapter 15, verse 13, the scripture says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, he's the God of hope. One of the descriptions of God is that he's the God of hope, and the God of hope fills us With his spirit of hope. Hope is important to God. Somebody say, there's always hope. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. The scripture reads, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. But look at this. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Rejoicing in hope actually helps us walk through our challenges, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, so that because we rejoice in hope, we're able to remain consistent under pressure. Look at this, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Even faith is intertwined with one's hope. 
1 Corinthians 13, 13, again, we see another picture of faith and hope walking together in tandem. And now abide, what? Faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Faith and hope together again. Your faith has nothing to do if you have nothing that you're hoping for. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. Your faith has nothing to do if you have no hope in your life. God wants us to have hope. Somebody say, there's always hope. Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and 25. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Our salvation actually secures our hope. So we have people who, these movies come out. Sometimes, you know, heaven is for real or, you know, 90 minutes in heaven, things like that. And the, the people, the church flocks to the theater and we watch them and we come out. Oh, my gosh, that was so inspiring. And I'm always wondering why. Like, why was that inspiring? Oh, you know, the whole heaven is for real. That was something. Don't you believe in heaven? Well, you know, um, you know, uh, yeah. If you don't believe in heaven, it's much easier to believe in the concept of heaven than believe in God. And so if this is moving you in any significant way, I'm wondering, what were you believing before the movie came out? And why do you need the movie to tell you heaven is real? Are you living with a worldly hope? Like, I hope there's a heaven, double cross. Or do you have an earnest expectation that I'm going, I'm just waiting for the fulfillment of that which God promised me? When we got saved, our salvation actually secures our hope. Look at this. Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Yeshua, that you may be of one, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua Christ. The, the, the hope that God gives us in his word, one thing God's word does for us is fill us with hope. And from that place, we should with one mind and one mouth be glorifying our Father because the Word of God has filled us with hope. We believe His Word, and therefore we are filled with hope. Not only that, but He wants us to be sure. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, In Him you also trusted, after you heard the Word of truth. There it is, the Word of God again coming in, the gospel of salvation, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also... Having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of the inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Your having the Holy Spirit is supposed to, to seal the deal that the promise of God is sure. And it says, to the praise of his glory. I told you we are living for the glory of God he left no doubt. The only way to have doubt now is if you do not have the Holy Spirit. Because if you have the Holy Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, you can't explain that. How, how is it that the Spirit of God is living in you? That spooky, spooky. Half the people calling themselves Christians don't even believe that they have the Holy Spirit. And many of them don't. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, how can you be sure 
that heaven is for real. How I know that heaven is for real is because the spirit of Christ lives in me and his presence reveals to me that I have been connected to something that is from beyond this realm. And so I am assured that everything else that comes with the word of God is true. You should have the same assurance. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Yeshua Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You see it again? The glory of God. The hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character produces hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I'm not making it up. I'm just trying to help y'all not settle for religion when you could have relationship. I'm sorry. I'm just reading the Bible. And I, I apologize. If you've been in this thing for a long time and nobody ever taught this to you, but the fact that you're hearing it today, you can make a change. You can do something about it. You can pray to God for his spirit. You can say, Lord, I thought I was saved all these years. I've been living for you. I've been trying to live the Christian life. And I, I, thought, I thought I was doing it right. I was trying to please you. But in truth, I have not received your Holy Spirit. There's no shame in that game. There's only hope. And all you have to do is ask him for his Holy Spirit. Ask and keep on asking until you receive it. And that brings us to Colossians 1, 27. Because we see that God even uses our challenging circumstances to produce hope. And now we come to this place where it says, To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in us is our source of hope. Therefore, church, there's only hope. I got to say there's only hope. If there's one word that sums up the Christian life, it's hope. Hearing of the possibility to experience God daily should fill us with hope. If hearing about the kingdom life discourages you, I'm here to tell you you're being lied to. That serpent of old is trying to deceive you to keep you from hope. So exchange the lie for the truth of God, and step over into living as a saved and surrendered child of God. There's only hope in God. The truth is, when we make room for God, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he will come where we are and he will reveal his presence and blow our minds. Like the woman by the well, she ran away and said, come see a man who told me all the things I ever did, like the man by sitting in front of the, the, the gate, the temple, of the beautiful gate. He went and leaping and jumping and praising God and telling everybody that he'd been healed. Listen, here's the truth. The Christian life is show and tell. God shows, we tell. My question is, have you seen him? And if you haven't, there's only hope. If this message resonated with you and you say, oh, I, I, I definitely need to respond. I believe this is a message that demands a response, in fact. I believe that you've got to answer several questions along the way. Are you a theoretical 
Christian? Are you an experiential Christian? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Or had no one told you that you were supposed to carry the Holy Spirit? Do you know for sure that you have received the Holy Spirit? Does the Word of God fill you with hope or with a sense of condemnation and shame? There are certain, we've got to, we have got to respond to this message. This is not one of those you hear and say, oh, I just love that. that was, no, it wasn't that message. This is a message that demands a response. And if you are prepared to respond to that message, I am prepared to pray with you. I'm going to ask you wherever you are to stand on your feet if you are able to stand, and I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father, I thank you that there is only hope in you. I thank you for Christ in us, the hope of glory. Father, inject hope into the hopeless heart. Stir hope in the overwhelmed heart. There is no condemnation in you for us. Thank you that there's only hope in you. My brothers and sisters, there's only hope. You, you will never share the gospel with anybody if you don't recognize that it is a message of hope. We've been taught that there's certain things that we just don't talk about. We don't talk about politics. We don't talk about religion. I'm sorry, this is not religion. You've been coming to Kingdom Life for any amount of time and you think this is religion. If you call me, I'm going to do personal classes with you to teach you the difference between religion and authentic relationship with Yeshua Christ. This is not religion. This is not what you got growing up. This is not that. This is authentic relationship where you receive the Spirit of Christ in you and He transforms you from the inside out and uses you as his POC. That's what this is. And so as you've heard this, as you've heard this message, wherever you come out, I pray that you will press in God because you, you can have experience with God. You do not have to be left as a theoretical Christian. You can know that you know that God is active in your life. And for anyone to claim to carry Christ and not experience him being active in their life, that's just a deception. That can't be right any more than I would be exposed to high-level radiation and you come next to me and, and you have a meter and you can't tell that I've been infected. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. I don't buy it. If the creator of the universe has put his spirit on the inside of you, you could not go a day without the experience of God moving in your life, speaking to your heart, doing something to answer prayer. You just couldn't do it. It's just not, it's not feasible. It just, it just, it doesn't hunt. That dog doesn't hunt. So I'm trying to call you into an authentic relationship with him. And I pray that you take this message and sow it into life into good ground and apply this word in every area of your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to, to share your word and to put before your people some, some significant choices that you would call us today to a place to respond to you. And I thank you, Father, for the opportunity that you've given me, your mailman, to deliver this mail. I delivered in love. I delivered in compassion. I delivered in humility. And I delivered, Lord God, wanting only that you would get the glory in the lives of your people. I thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Bless your people. Keep them until we meet again. In the name of Yeshua, we do pray all these things. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless everybody. Have a great week. And we'll see you next week right here at Kingdom Life Live. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to another life-changing message from Kingdom Life Community. If today's message blessed you, please like, comment, and subscribe. But most importantly, share. 
Share this message with your family, friends, coworkers, or anyone else you think needs to hear this word. You never know how it will impact them. We pray that you have a blessed week and remember to live the kingdom life. We'll see you soon.